Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunga Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off the Ball Network. And in today's episode, we're going to be covering a number of topics. We're going to be breaking down, you know, the Kyrie Irving news and, you know, the Sean Marks situation. And then we're also going to follow that up by, you know, discussing Russell Westbrook and, you know, the Lakers front office and the decisions that they got to make. But before we get started with today's episode, we have a special guest on the Ball Fake Podcast. You know, he's a YouTube content creator, also a member of the Pick Aside Podcast. We we understand they're an up and coming podcast. Welcome to the show, John Tortorelli. How are you doing today, man? Thank you. I'm good. How about you? Thank you again for having me on. Glad to be here. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. And, you know, before the show, we were discussing, you know, our thoughts on this Kyrie Irving situation. And, you know, I, I want to start off the episode discussing that right now. Obviously, the Brooklyn Nets, they've been seemingly in a dumpster fire for the better half of the last two and a half, three seasons for the most part, you know, dealing with Kyrie Irving injuries, his antics off the basketball court. But when the news first initial broke about, you know, the Nets not willing to, you know, sign Ky- Kyrie Irving to an extended contract, what was your opinion on that? To me, it wasn't surprising because Sean Marks, I just feel so bad for the guy. Like, he comes into Brooklyn and his initial precursor to the KD Kyrie team is these guys have chips on their shoulders. He brings all the men because his personality looks for dogs. You know, guys that have been sort of given up on by the rest of the league. You look at Spencer Dinwiddie, Joe Harris, Jared Allen. He wasn't even a top 20 pick in 2017. Kind of crazy looking back at it now. Of course, D'Angelo Russell, the Lakers didn't want him. He didn't want to play Alonzo Ball. And so all these guys come into Brooklyn and they build this culture. And with Kyrie Irving, they've deviated from that in many ways. Of course, the coach in Kenny Atkinson has changed. The players, because by and large, Kyrie scared of management and Sean Marks into thinking, oh, maybe he may not be available for us. We need to get another star. So they spend all these assets on James Harden. Then they realize we've deviated from our core standards and those concepts that made us such an appealing team in the first place. And that was where we were more exciting and fun. So to me, I wasn't surprised to see that by Sean Marks necessarily, but it's just so shocking that like, oh wait, we're gonna put this out there when we also wanna accentuate his value as a trade option. You know, assuming they don't give him an extension with a, you know, a no trade clause, you wanna do everything posturing to just make sure you have that optionality with the most amount of trade assets and, or trade value for a better word. You know what I mean? So that to me was kind of confusing. I feel like you'd want to talk Kyrie up as much as you can just because it's BS, but that posturing is what's going to help you get more value from him. But I mean, it's such a, such a strange fine line to dance because Kyrie's a top seven point guard easily when playing, but there's so many caveats that come with Kyrie and these, these layers to his personality and it's not just Kyrie Irving, the basketball player you're taking in, but it's Kyrie the human, Kyrie the social activist, and all these things that layer into one another. And it's like, we're just trying to win a title. To me, it was kind of weird because I feel like, I feel like Sean Marks is trying to, once again, trying to regain control and leverage in this situation. And that's gonna bring me up to my next question. Who has the most leverage in this situation? Is it Sean Marks in the front office or is it Kyrie Irving and you know his superstar status? I guess originally it's ownership and you know they want to spend as much money on the team Joseph Tsai um, and then after ownership I suppose it's shut marks right because Kyrie like with all these layers to him many teams around the league don't want to take these shots on him and so his his market value is low and going to Brooklyn where he gets to play KD that opportunity is not necessarily going to present itself in many other stable places because like even though the Nets are stuck with Kyrie and Ben Simmons, for the most part, the organization, management-wise, is stable. And when you have a very quality GM that knows what he's doing, and you can say what you want about the James Harden trades, the, the two iterations of them, but the stability Sean Marks brings, I feel like just that level of gravitas he has as a GM, though he hasn't won a title, he has clearly done a very good job in Brooklyn. I feel like for Kyrie, he's the one that's answering him just because this is Sean Marks, one of the better gyms in the league, no questions about it. And for Kyrie, he's 30 years old, right? This next contract would go if it's a five-year deal to 35 years old. I mean, it's tough pickings because there's no guarantee with his availability, he's going to get that long-term contract and that money he wants. So... 
for me, in my opinion, I honestly do believe Kyrie Irving still has all the leverage in the world in this situation, as oddly as that sounds, right? Because we got to think about it from this standpoint. Now, obviously, we understood. It seems like at the time period when they brought him back, it was more so having to do with the fact that, you know, Brooklyn was under ban. I think they had at most seven or eight players available at the time. That was when everybody was sent to safety and health protocols during that time. So it made sense to bring him back into the mix. But once again, this is an organization that had a firm word. Look, if you're going to go 50-50, then we're not going to allow you to play basketball whatsoever. And they went back on their word from that perspective. And then not to mention just Kyrie Irving from a basketball standpoint. Like, do you really want to send Kevin Durant out there? Understandably knowing that, you know, Seth Curry and Ben Simmons and the rest of this supporting cast is pretty adequate. You know, they look like a playoff team. But given Durant, he's going to be a year older. You know, he's not getting any younger. His durability is getting a little bit questionable at this point of his career. Not saying he, he's not a LeBron James or anything like that. But, you know, you have to take some of those things into account. And I think in that scenario, when we bring all of those considerations into the dynamic of, you know, a long-term contract with Kyrie Irving, it more than likely looks like he has the most leverage in this entire situation. But let's say there's a scenario where Kyrie Irving does end up not resigning with the team. Is there a real possibility of Brooklyn actually letting Kyrie Irving walk and being happy about it? I don't think so. <laughs> you lost so many assets in the heart. Like, sure, you got back Drummond and two first round picks and Seth Curry, but those two firsts are late in the first round. Seth Curry is good, but he's expendable by like 80% just because he can't defend, right? Um, and I feel like for the Nets to then get nothing in return for Kyrie on top of the Harden package, where they sent out, what was it, seven first round picks, three of them were pick swaps. I feel like for them, they've lost so many assets and they've split themselves too thin in that that you know that treasure chest they need to figure out ways with the money that kevin durant's making as well as ben simmons to just gain some leverage and capital to have the autonomy to make moves and if you let Kyrie move for nothing or let him walk for nothing i mean you've completely failed this era because not only especially this summer you've gotten nothing out of Kyrie in the big picture but i mean like literally with the lack of accomplishment you've gotten nothing in return for the player as an asset and i feel like for them you have to be able to find a way via sign trade few teams have cap space that are relevant you know like okc and indiana they're not signing Kyrie. if i'm a team like the clippers or the lakers that's looking to add maybe a, a multifaceted score into the lineup and i have the pieces to supplement his weaknesses i'm gonna throw some contracts in a trade and that's gonna get a second round pick and then like maybe a first maybe two first just those little may not be a lottery pick but just those little things that you can add up into you know packaging into a decent deal with maybe ben simmons you just got to make the most out of what you have so i don't think so the final thing i want to talk about before we end up you know moving on to the russell westbrook situation obviously Kyrie irving the main reason why you know he's been able to get away with so much of the things he's been able to get away with has to do with him being able to lean on kevin durant's shoulder with that being said, I want to know what element and what level of impact does Kevin Durant play in this entire situation? What's his role? Obviously, you know, he's not going to be the one signing Kyrie Irving's contracts and things of that nature. But I mean, how much of a impact does his uh, word of mouth necessarily play in this dynamic? I think he's just shocked right now because <laughs> he and Kyrie tried to build this thing, right? They they take the approach of we don't want Kenny Atkinson. We prefer Steve, Steve Nash great guy personality wise hard to clash with you get stars it's the perfect stabilizer but then you look at the other moves this team's made deandre jordan they took less money just so dj could sign with them and i feel like the boston series was a realization for kevin hey maybe i'm not too good at like this have a say in the way things are done gm thing maybe i'm just the player and i should let sean marks who is really good at his job by the way do what he does best and i feel like the, the realization that you don't you don't have the wing players to accommodate kevin he's just saying to himself look you got me locked up um you talked about his durability a lot of it is he's playing 40 minutes a game almost just trying to trip carry this team steve nash can't do anything else and it's like all right kevin just go out there and do your thing there's no support and for him it's the realization i'm actually harming myself and my own body and my team and my career maybe it's best for me to focus in on being a player and just let Sean Marks build this thing, you know? Like, <laughs> I can't 
I can't have this thing or that thing. It turns out like it got me to a first round sweep. We didn't even win a playoff game this year. Last year we didn't make it at the second round. Sure, if his toe wasn't the line, they probably wouldn't. Wasn't on the line, they probably win the title. But that's a different story. It was. Uh, I feel like for Kevin, he's just hit the realization. Oh wait, like this is Sean Mark's job, and you know you just do your thing, figure it out, with Kyrie. But I just need better help than this. Yeah, and I think you know, given the pieces that they have now, Ben Simmons, you know, great point of attack, arguably the best defender in, in the entire NBA. He's gonna come in. He's gonna have a high matchup difficulty. So you know, Kevin Durant, he's not gonna be having to exert so much energy on the other side of the basketball because you know, in Kyrie Irving's absence, he had to you know kind of play both of those roles, being the scoring load um, person that you know takes on a lot of responsibility from that aspect, and then also having to play a little bit of. Uh, not necessarily the role of a point of attack, but you know, in certain instances, them relying on his rim protection and somewhat anchoring this Brooklyn Nets defense that is, you know, primarily going to be small because they like to run their program on a lot of small ball lineups and things of that nature. But let's shift the conversation over to the opposing coast. We're going to talk about the Lakers here real quick. Now, obviously, we all heard the reports about, you know, them not wanting to attach the first round pick to Russell Westbrook. I mean, what was your initial thoughts to that, so to speak? It's nice. Like, I want nice things. It's like wanting to work for one that has something nice and just not working for it. Like, the reality is, do you think Russ is the worst contract in the NBA? I mean, more than likely, yeah. Unless we want to bring in John Wall, I mean, what's the value there? But it's pretty debatable. And the, the thing about Russell Westbrook, too, is like, they asked him to play like this complimentary role next to LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and he's never been a complimentary player whatsoever. Westbrook is not gonna be a guy that's gonna adjust to what's around him. It's the other way around. And I think the Lakers definitely made a mistake with that. I still felt like going into the season though, there I had a little bit of optimism. I had them more so as a fifth seed at worst. Definitely wasn't expecting them to necessarily come in and you know just have a great start to start off the year. So the slow start wasn't any surprise to me. But I mean, when you finish the year as an 11th seed, avoid the playing tournament, and you know, also including that this is a team that was just what two seasons removed from a championship, the drastic fall off, it's something that I just continue to scoff at daily. And I think, you know, some of it also has to do with not only roster, but you know, LeBron James and Anthony Davis approach heading into, you know, training camp this year. They were definitely in cruise mode. And I felt like that was an approach that they more so should have had the season prior to this season because you know they were fresh off a championship and they didn't have that much of a resting point in the off season after that 2020 bubble and things of that nature i think john wall's got a little more value as a player but yeah i mean lebron and ad just gave up on frank vogel system we're looking at russ the player we talk about layers we could talk about lakers core values as an organization on an entirely separate note but Rest of the player is just too inherently. He's like a, a six foot three center that can't space the floor and has zero gravity. And that in and of itself, when he's an erratic decision maker and terrible defensively. Like, let's not get this twisted. He's last year one of the worst guards defender. He doesn't box out. It's like, cool, get me some rebounds. But I mean, like, he's just wandering around out there. He's not trying to track people off ball. He's not necessarily setting a tone as a communicator, diving all loose balls, and the lack of hustle. I and mean, people will say, oh, he works hard. But like, in reality, Russ is such a flawed player. The Lakers talk about posturing. They got to do everything they can to leak stuff. But hey, you want to run this thing back. Like, th whatever you can to gain a little bit of leverage in negotiations. And then they're eventually going to realize we have to trade Russ. LeBron's going into his 20th season. You can't keep him. But you can do everything you can right before the season to say, hey, like, this one team's like, oh, you guys, only one year of his contract. You give us a 2027 first round pick. And like, maybe this isn't so bad, you know, what the heck? We could just bring him off for a bench. That, and then you get stuck in the rest of Westbrook, the phase, and you get to deal with him for a year, sure. But you also get his bird rights. If it's a team that just wants to sell tickets, and like, hey, we can maybe make this thing work for us. And they talk themselves into it. All the sudden the Lakers have, maybe it's Malcolm Brogdon. And the Pacers got themselves a great first round pick. And along with Malcolm Brogdon, maybe they get a little additional piece. Or if it's the Charlotte Hornets, of course, Gordon Hayward and like Kelly Oubre would be the dream. Just get a little bit of athleticism on the wings. And I think the Lakers, no matter what, you just got to accept and swallow. Like, you screwed over this trade, and it's one of the worst and most destructive things you could have done to your team. Now you got to be honest with yourself. Say, hey, we lost this thing, but we're going to do everything we can to at least satiated for this 20th year of LeBron James, you know? Yeah, I mean, my initial thoughts was the Lakers understand 
there's not really much that they can do to get back within contention, right? I mentioned, you know, they were just two years removed from the title. And, you know, judging by the roster and the contracts, not in a good place, obviously, with Russell Westbrook starting off. But Rob Polinka and whoever is running this front office, because we do not know who is running this front office. It's, it's simple. You got the Rambuses. Don't ask me why. LeBron, Rich Paul, Polinka. Get yeah, those five, and then Gene Bus. She's in there as the you know she's the owner, obviously. And then you've got one or two more people off the top of my head. Maybe Phil Jackson is one of them. Maybe he's back in there. It's, it's this weird. They run like a, a, a you know like a, a mom and pop shop, but it's the LA Lakers. You know, like <laughs> you gotta go all the way into the luxury tax area. Alex Curry say you can't just say ah oh, no we don't. It, it, if you think she, Gene Bus was talking about like we didn't go far enough in the playoffs. Alex Cruz is the exact player you need to go deep, deeper in the playoffs. But I mean, like, you're willing to pay all this money for us, and then like, you know, the playoff team as is, doesn't even matter. Uh, but I mean, there's two more people in that in that category of people. But like, the Rambuses are somewhere in there. I'm sure Rich Paul is. All of it to me is frustrating because they have no stability or structure with it. So. Yeah, and I and I feel like they're too worried. I mean, obviously the return matters, but what do you expect? given, you know, Russell Westbrook's trade value right now. But, you know, just to close out the episode, we got to talk about LeBron if we're going to mention the Los Angeles Lakers, right? How is he feeling going into next season? Does he have a different mentality given, you know, this is a team that not only missed the postseason, but, you know, missed the play-in tournament? Is he going in with the uh, understanding that, look, I have to just try to, you know, get us to contention for the postseason? Or is it a kind of a day-by-day type of thing with LeBron and the Lakers? Definitely in his mind, it's a day-by-day thing, but in the the big picture, he cannot be frustrated because the exact thing he could have feared with their their brain trust is exactly what went wrong. And because of that, you don't feel like you have the support of the front office because you feel like they're incompetent. And when the people that are your boss and they're supposed to be running this business are not very capable of building continuity, chemistry, these little things that build sustainable winners in sports. LeBron's saying to himself, you guys better figure this out soon, because if you don't, I cannot be here with you. And I do not mind leaving and leaving you guys with no assets or nothing. I got to do what's best for my career. But yeah, I mean, for him, it's a legend. They take it day by day. Uh, I feel like he's just hoping Anthony Davis can start to do something right when it comes to keeping his body right. If he doesn't, I mean, LeBron's got no shot of getting this team to a top three seed next year. If AD ain't playing like 55 games at 85% of what we expect AD to be. So that's tough. It's, it's tough pickings, you know? Yeah, and hopefully AD can, you know, get to some level of competency where, you know, not maybe he doesn't necessarily need to be a top five player in the world or anything of that nature, but you definitely have to crack the top 10 area. But I mean, with all that stuff being said, maybe by the time we get done finishing this pod, you know, maybe there's some more news about Russell Westbrook and maybe this Kyrie Irving situation. But John, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Hopefully we can have you come on another time. You know, this is really fun for me. I'm sure you had a great time as well. But outside of that, thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode with me here on the Ball Fake Podcast. John, is there anything you want to plug before we close today's episode? Um, out? If you want to find me on YouTube, it's John Tortorelli, T-O-R-T-O-R-E-L-L-I. I'm on TikTok. Uh, Instagram and Twitter as well. Be sure to follow me there. And thank you so much again for having me on. It was a great time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Well, thank you guys for tuning into another episode with me here on the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating, like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notification and give us a nice review. But besides that, it's your boy, Nice Chunky Beanie. You're listening to the Ball Fake Podcast. And we are. Praise God.